Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where we discuss what's been going on in the week, yes, even in the winter, and look ahead to the week ahead as well, if there's anything coming up. As always, I'm joined by Patrick Blake of Audi Cycling and also Mr. Grogg himself, Ewan Wilson. I mean, guys, yeah, as last week, we're very, well, we're not that thin on the ground, but uh, yeah, cyclocross in Dublin. I mean, if you follow the news, Dublin was a bit on fire, not because of the cyclocross, but other reasons. Anyways, the World Cup event, anyone catch up with that? It wouldn't have been a fire if they had the weather that they had at the Dublin race, not so sure, because it was muddy as hell. Now, I didn't watch it live. I'm not even sure if it was on, like, the what, uh, GCN Plus or whatever, you know, that whole thing that's going on still. I'm not even sure if it was on there. So, I can confirm it was. I was watching it there. Was it? Oh, well. I was just doing other things. I'm trying to create an excuse here, Scott. You're right. <laughs> Thibaut Nace didn't win. He got stuck in sand. And his teammate won instead. So it's just kind of is what it is. But yeah, we're going to be talking about cyclocross a bit today because there's a bit of just like... Don't know. Um, ripples in the water, isn't there? Like cyclocross has always been quite a nailed on thing with big names and stuff. We talked about it last week with Wout Van Aert and how on Pidcock as well talked about how they might not do world champs and now the other kind of name is also kind of floating around. I don't want to kind of like fully spoil it, but bit of a prelude. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's been a bit quiet, but we've got a couple of off bike sort of stories, I guess, which are interesting enough. I should get my Irish citizenship revoked. I didn't. I didn't watch the the Dublin race. I'm sorry. I can't really add much to this conversation. Well, if we run down the uh, results, Pim Ronhard took the victory in front of Lawrence Swig and Ilya Isabit, and Lucinda Brand she actually beat Alrado and uh, Backstead in the women's. And then we also had Tibor Del Grosso that we mentioned last week winning. Uh, yeah, but with that section out of the way we might as well go to uh my, yeah what's the story patrick that you're alluding to there was like some quote from ride magazine or something like that which people have commented on on twitter saying that it's got like no backing or it was like taken out of context but you know what it's the off season people and we need stuff to talk about so we're going to jump on it so the t- story is that vanderpool is talking about the kind of difficulty of balancing multiple disciplines, I suppose. And maybe this is because of the other stuff we were talking about last week with Van Aert and Pitcock, but there seems to be an indication that Van der Poel might stop in the future doing cyclocross and just focus maybe just solely on road. And I just thought it was interesting that we've always sort of put these riders who can do multiple disciplines on a bit of a pedestal ahead of the rest of the peloton, like they're like a bit of a demigod that they can do multiple things. But... I guess now we're coming maybe into an era where the cycling sphere is super competitive with the big old Galactic Coast guys maybe just, you know, finding it harder and harder to beat each other and maybe Van der Poel and Von Aert are seeing that cyclocross is getting in the way of their success. Do, do you guys think there's any weight behind that or not? There's definitely some weight behind it because these guys are road stars now where they're, they're sort of well, but they are the world champion, they're grand tour contenders, and while Van Aert and um, Matthew Van der Poel's case, it's it's not like back in the day where you'd have a cyclocross rider who was maybe a bit of a novel act on the road, or novelty act rather, on the road. These are guys who are really targeting big things, and it is difficult to sort of balance these two these two disciplines, especially when the off season of the road season is when the cyclocross season should be in full force. You don't really have time off, and for these road riders, that time off is super precious because once the road season is in full swing then, I mean, they're flying about left, right, and center from Canada to to the UAE and to France, Belgium, all these different kind of places to, to race. So it, it is definitely hard. It's taxing, particularly on these guys who have I mean, young kids like 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 Wout Van Aert, for instance, we've seen sort of scaling back his calendar over the past couple of years in cyclocross. It, it might be a very different sort of ecosystem if we did have riders who maybe weren't so multidisciplined nowadays. Uh, we see riders able to balance our mountain biking in the road maybe more than cyclocross and the road, but for riders to do both cyclocross road and mountain bike, like Matty van der Poel and Tom Pitcock, and potentially this Danish wonder kid that's coming up through the ranks at the moment, who we might be talking about later on, uh, even like Thibaut Nace, for instance, as well, it's, it's going to be super, super difficult for these guys to balance out all these three things. We said it all the time whenever we talk about Tom Pitcock, it's like one thing is going to be dropped, really, so you can be the best at one of these disciplines. Matty van der Poel has proved he was sort of the best at cyclocross and the road this year, but that is incredibly rare. 
uh, for a rider to do so. And also, bear in mind, the Road World Championships were a month and a half earlier than they usually are. Yeah, doing three is quite incredible. Like that season he had this year, like you said, well, dominating in, in the cyclocross and then going on to win Milan San Remo, Paro Bay, and then the Worlds, Belgian Tour as well. Not necessarily dominating in, in cyclocross in the races he turned up to, yes, but there were yeah, yeah. he didn't turn up to. Which would you think like to to fully devote like the, a calendar to cyclocross and to road? I think that makes it really difficult. And then yeah, but they haven't done that. And last week as well, how yeah. does it feel for that discipline to just have these stars parachute into one race and then disappear for the rest of the year? That didn't really happen back in the day in cyclocross. That's more of a modern phenomenon. I think it's but, just it, it's more that cyclocross has sort of been the the victim of the superstar success in the road. Yeah, that's true. But you'd want that, though. I'd rather want much of Unpol just to appear in a few races and do both than not do any cyclocross. That feels a bit of a shame. Yeah, I find it surprising that of all the people, it's Van der Poel, who's been kind of a one who's maybe alluded to this, is that I thought, you know, Pidcock and Van Aert, I think you can sort of warrant them more maybe not doing it because I think that their road season is a bit more intense, dare I say. Like, they probably have more race days maybe than Van der Poel does. And they're more of like supporting their team. And I can imagine the pressure from a team being a bit more for them. Whereas Vanderpool definitely blows hot and cold. Like, and I, I mean, I mean hot and, and Baltic cold. Like he can do really good in a race or really bad. And it feels like in terms of competitive race days, Vanderpool doesn't need to be like on it as much as Pidcock and Van Aert because when Vanderpool does come in hot, he like pulls it off massively and he like gets a really big result i imagine that alps and de Kernick, considering that van der Poel's one of the main men doesn't need to be like oh we need you in fit climbing form for all the grand tours it's kind of like if you're good for like a couple of the grand tour stages in the tour and you get a stage winner too then that's good whereas van Arm and pidcock need to be doing it all the time so i can imagine them being like oh i can't do cyclocross because it's actually like burning me out in the season a bit too much whereas van der Poel's just like ah whatever you know if I start doing bad, I'll start doing bad. I'm, I'm Matthew Van Der Poel, it doesn't matter. But just like sort of to, to get back onto the article, it's, it's that it spoke of him taking potentially a year out in the years to come. It's not necessarily sort of fully quitting. I think it, it, it might be just sort of to take a pause and to experiment. Maybe it doesn't work out, maybe he misses it um, and so forth. Also for Van Der Poel, he's earning an awful lot of money doing cyclocross races. I know Scott, you you're, you always talk about how the, 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 the big paychecks these guys get for, for going to these cyclocross races and I mean, it's feel like, I mean, yeah, they have like these big appearance fees and for him to have that in the off season and also to have all his press work and so forth for, for cyclocross, a lot of that Matthew van der Poel brand, although it sort of feels like it's now been overshadowed by the road brand, a lot of his brand is in cyclocross and that's in the, na the nation he represents in, in the Netherlands and also his home nation of, of Belgium, where the, the racing is, is, is huge. It's where he lives. It's where he make, makes an awful lot of money. His, his road and cyclocross team is registered in Belgium. It's probably really important for them. And also how do Alperson feel about this as well? Because he's their big star in cyclocross. There are other cyclocross riders for Alperson to Kodak, but no one's quite on the same level as, as, as Matthew van der Poel. They don't really have someone else to fly the banner in the men's discipline. They do in the women's, but for the men's without van der Poel, who else do they really have? They need to sign up Pim Ronhar or one of these guys to wear their jerseys at, at, at the top races. Because for Alperson to Kodak, this is a huge chance for them to get their name out there. 12 months of the year instead of it just being the road season from March through to September. I mean, what you guys said earlier as well, that none of you really watched the Dublin World Cup race. If Macho Van Der Poel was there, I'm pretty sure both of you might have watched it or not. Even with like, with like Van Aert as well, even with, with like either Van Der Poel or Van Aert being there, I, I think would definitely make it far more captivating. That big name value is hugely important in cyclocross, particularly at the moment with these sort of the cyclocross galacticos that we have, Thibaut Nace isn't quite there yet, but Van Aan, Van Der Poel, I mean, their name value is, is is huge for the sport. And for them to move out of it, what does that mean for the sustainability of cyclocross? I just hope this isn't like the end of, because it feels like we're going through a really hot period of cyclocross riders being real hot property and easily just jumping into road and seemingly just taking it like a duck to water. And I just don't want this to be like, the end and it's just like a now an immediate divide between cyclocross and road and there's just no flip flap between it so hopefully we still get the big names going to cyclocross otherwise i'll be a bit bit, bit rubbish so hopefully everything remains kind of as it is and this isn't is necessarily just a vandable problem as well like we've got Thibaut Nace coming through the ranks who's also looking to really target the road with legal trek that danish wonder kid whose name is escaping me right now Philipson. 
Phillips and that's it. He as well, cyclocross, road and mountain bike. He was, he's been sort of looking for a contract for 2025 and it's been very sort of specific about having a team that can support him in all three disciplines. This, this could be a problem or well, not a problem, but like a, a, a sort of a difficult situation for, for lots of these, lots of these riders coming through also in, in the women's discipline as well. There are plenty of riders, Peter Sir, Van Empel in particular, you've also got the Packstedts as well, um, who are also greater cyclocross greater the road and in peterson's case greater mountain biking as well how do they balance these all out without burning themselves out for these guys are they going to have the same sort of shelf life of being up to their mid 30s in in a professional team or are they going to burn out early because they've had a, a season that's far more intense than all the other riders so Van der Poel might be a sort of cautionary tale for these other guys. He might be able to set a precedent. I know we've had like Stinek Stibar and so forth in the past, but when Stinek Stibar was really hitting out of the road, he wasn't doing cyclocross. Uh, Lars Bohm as well, he did road in sort of the second half of his career. First half was more cyclocross. It really is sort of like this new sort of post-COVID generation can do both. And Van der Poel is sort of the flag bearer for this. If he can make it work, then great. But he might also be... A guy who just admits, you know what, I can do both all the time. It's just too much. But like when you look at cyclocross, it's like one hour event. So you could say it's just a one hour training event for Mike Vanderbilt. It just disappears off the front anyway. So he would be doing that anyway in Alpe or wherever. And instead he's doing it on a rainy Tuesday, no, not Tuesday, Sunday in Zolder. It's still like one hour of hard cardio and also like a lot more upper body action than... Is this speaking from experience? Hmm? Is this speaking from experience? No. <laughs> um, I've, I've not done cyclocross. Um, Have you, Patrick? Not... Yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of cyclocross. Uh, it does hurt your back, I'll tell you. You have to like properly like shuffle, like especially when going uphill. But yeah, I've, I've only done like a handful of cyclocross races. I've decided I'm just going to stick to summer cyclocross now. Winter's just... Winter's awful for riding. Just don't do it, people. It's a terrible decision. Go do another sport. Maybe in 2024, we can do a cyclocross event together. But uh, us aside, Thibaut Nath, Patrick, you wanted to talk about this extension, talking about the Wonder Kids getting a long extension, Beetle Trek, and uh, yeah, how big is it? Until 2026, because we were doing our Lidl Trek preview, and then literally like two days after this was announced, because during the video, I was saying it's kind of criminal that Lidl Trek haven't got this guy signed up for a longer period of time. Because I also remember a few weeks back, or it might have been last week, we were talking about Jonas and the World Championships. And I said that there seems to be a lack of pure punchers in the peloton. But could Thibaut Nath be this pure puncher that has sort of faded away? Like what Alaphilippe has been in the past, for example. Or like Valverde, Dan Martin... At like Liège, that kind of vibe. Because I feel like at the moment, the puncher, the pure puncher is sort of like a, a dying art. In the same way that a pure time trialist is a dying art, where people are just sort of mixing between being able to do puncher plus something else, Pagacha, for example. So now I just wanted to kind of discuss Thibaut Nace, he's in like 2021, and sort of what we think he might be capable of in the future. Because I see him as like a Ardennes classic kind of guy. But I'm intrigued to see what you guys might think. I agree in terms of his rider profile. I think we, we saw this year that this, there was a stage of the Tour of Norway in particular where I think we really saw him demonstrate that explosive kick he has. I know that uh, that field wasn't necessarily the strongest, uh, but you did have world tour riders who were there. And I think he he demonstrates a bit of a sort of uh, a wild flair about him that will be very interesting to see on the road. He's only been riding with Lidl Track since the sort of first of August, so only a couple of months now. But uh, he's looking super promising for the new year, new year with already two professional victories under his belt. I mean, he is this, this multidisciplined rider. I think maybe as well with, with sort of that family name behind him, he has the potential to really be a sort of a galactico. In the spring classics, I don't know if he can be like a sort of an all-round Galactico, like, like with Van der Poel and Van Aan and so forth, but definitely in like a sort of flesh wallon kind of finish, I could definitely see Thibaut Nace trying to sort of spring away um, as long as it doesn't cloud his sort of ambitions with GC and all the, all these different kind of things. I, I think Thibaut Nace could be quite the interesting figure in the professional peloton. And I don't think he he's just a flash in the pan like we've seen with plenty of other riders, particularly in sort of the COVID period of 2020 through to 2021 where we saw lots of these younger guys we thought maybe they have glim glimpses of being a great puncher like now even save it on and so forth 
who sort of maybe faded away. I think that Thibaut Nace has really sort of given us a good sort of sense of who he is, who he could be as a rider. And you cannot look past that gene pool that he's from, you know. His father, if you don't know, Sven Nace, one of the best cyclocross riders of all time. It really is sort of, it, it, it's fitting that uh, that he's making a big splash as a youngster. Among the likes in cyclocross and probably in the road next year. But his dad never actually, well, like you said, legend of the sport, world champion, etc. But he never actually did well on the road, which I found really strange. But that was in that period bef- before like, when cyclocross riders didn't do road. I guess, like... You look at now, though. Like, we've got Lawrence Sweet, Ile Isabit, all these guys who, on their day, can potentially beat a Pitcock and definitely mm. top three. But none of them have, like, anything on the road. It's so bizarre. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. Like, even, like, Lars Van der Haar has been around for, like, he had a World, world Tour contract for a couple of years with what is now known as Team DSM, but he never really did anything on the road. He's still, I mean... It's, Sven Nays, he's still a legend of the sport, and Thibaut has, has shown in terms of his road ability that his road ability is good enough to be right up there. You know, a guy who finishes third place at the Tour of Norway in GC and wins a pretty convincing, punchy stage there in strong form, as well as a European Championship victory in the under 23 category, beating the likes of Juan Ayuso, for instance, and Pippo Zana, I think really shows that he is quite the star in the making. And Lidl Trek is a really interesting team for him to go to. You don't really have a classic star at the moment and these punchy kind of finishes. They have a lot of solid guys, but no real star, I would say. Ilmo also. Ilmo also was second in Flesh for Long. Oh, okay, okay. But like, it's it's not like he's battling against a sort of a Pogaccia or a Roglic or so forth. He has the opportunity to really like lead some of these uh, some of these punchier races next year. Yeah. Particularly if Skelmos is going more for GC as well. Yeah, definitely. He's just like so suited to like a, an Amstel Gold and a Liège and stuff. I just, I'm, I think also that's why I'm so excited about it is because it feels like every year there's sort of somebody who comes through who's a bit of a surprise act, but like Ben Healy this year was a bit of a surprise act in the Ardennes. And I just think, well, you know, if Thibaut Nace is given his opportunity, I know he is still very young, but I think that's just kind of like the era that we're in where you all kind of just expect people to be kind of flying by the time they're like 21, got another era of like the early 2010s. You were only given the opportunity of leadership past the age of 25. I mean, I'm not expecting to do like a grand tour next year. But I think just a little bit of an expansion, considering the small flash of a pan that we were given this year and the kind of, like, no, Arc Race of Norway also, I think there's, like, Barwell's Belgium tour as well. He did really good. Or it might have been Wallonie. I can't remember, but it was, it, was, it was one of the two. And I just think from that small flash of a pan, I was like, oh, you know, this guy's... I, I think that he's, like, the real, maybe, like, next Ardennes star in the making. And I'm just super excited to see somebody so specialist. Because I don't think he's very good at, like, time trialing or i don't think he's got gc aspirations so he's very much just like a one day pure specialist and in an era of ever crossing of disciplines i think that it's quite cool to see somebody so specialized yeah it's actually quite refreshing to see one of these wonder kids come up who's not like amazing at everything he is sort of like we don't have questions of could he be a gc rider could he be a time trialist could he be a sprinter it's like it was, it was very much like we kind of know what we're going to get with him and even just like looking at Lidl Track for the next couple of years, they've got a couple of really strong engines here. I mean, you mentioned Skelmoza, he's still 23, let's not forget. Quinn Simmons, who's 22. Matthias Vatsek, the current Czech road race champion, a good puncher as well. Good form, I believe, at Tour of Wallonia, maybe Tour of Belgium, one or the other. He's 21 years of age. These are all guys that could be like a really interesting sort of spring classic squad. And Thibaut Ace, of course, in the years to come um, for for Lidl Trek, who are really starting to look sort of more long-term with their strategy, especially after securing that Lidl um, name for the team. I just hope they change their jersey for next year. You know, I really don't want Thibaut Nace winning in this kit. It's, it's so awful. Sorry to dampen the mood. Ouch. At least it's better than DSM's. Oh, that's true. <laughs> However, apparently, I mean, we actually did get, get to talk about this the other week. DSM, now DSM post-NL. Oh, sorry, DSM Feminic post NL rolls off the tongue. Apparently, the jersey that they launched was 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 a temporary jersey. It could still change. Let's hope so, because <laughs> we can only hope. I think the everyone was like begging, begging for it to change, though. But I mean, yeah, Patrick, you said Ness did well at one of the Belgian races, particularly in the Belgian Tour Stage Four. Winner, Macho van der Poel on a punchy stage. Second place, Thibaut Ness. Yeah, I just can't wait. I, I expect that, yeah, he'll just take a bit of a step up from what, have a bit more of a full road season next year. But then I can't wait for him to, you know, just flesh out into this puncher star that we're all 
I think craving maybe a little bit in the kind of kind of nostalgic years of Alaphilippe gone by. I think we're all looking for somebody a bit like that. But anyway, you and you had a story you wanted to talk about about your favorite Danish rider. Yeah, um, this is in connection with Jonas Vingegaard. He had like quite a sort of interesting sit down interview with uh, Extablad or Extrabladets, as I would say, where they, uh, where Jonas spoke about his past and spoke about doping in, in, in cycling. He actually confessed to missing a doping test back in 2019. Uh, he said that he missed the, do- the doorbell go and uh, didn't do his doping test, which I thought was actually quite interesting that he admitted to this. Although, I mean, it's four years ago now. But with all the sort of question marks and so forth around like being a go, I mean, with all the haters out there, um, I'm surprised he sort of opened up to this. But at the same time, it's quite refreshing for him to actually just say this straight up. I think a lot of us fan, well, fans, spectators or whatever, don't necessarily know the realities of, of these doping tests and sort of the extent to which sort of they have to be enforced. And th- they do come to your house and, and the, the, like randomly and ask for samples and so forth. And for then you go to just say, oh yeah, I missed one and give sort of a glimpse into the reality of being a professional athlete is quite refreshing. But at the same time, also a little bit worrying because I mean, admitting to missing a doping test, I mean, as refreshing as it is, it is a little bit sort of, rogue for a grand tour champion to say this you know yeah i i, I get what you mean especially since i don't know i don't know how to fuel to the fire but 2019 was what that was the year where Jonas got his tour pull on your victory and i swear he did go to another race after that and i'm not saying that Jonas is doping that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is that it's just like yeah like you say you and it's kind of odd that somebody who has been in the limelight of you know is he doping Look at these incredible performances. People are, like you say, a lot of naysayers, a lot of people questioning and, you know, being skeptical about these sort of incredible performances. That he would like almost give them an avenue to have a go at. It, it is quite revealing, but I'm not sure whether maybe they thought it of an avenue of, oh, if we kind of show that we're open to discuss about this, maybe people will be more sympathetic towards us possibly here's a quote from the piece it's a good thing to be tested in also. danish in danish it's are you gonna do it in danish oh that's a shame go on you yeah. in english i'm not anyway um it, it's a good thing to be tested all the time but 20 years ago the writers were also tested somehow writers can still cheat so i don't want to just say as they used to that i am the writer who has tested the most all my tests are negative, but writers have done businesses in the past, and so people believe writers will do it again. I read that really horribly. So <laughs> yeah, I just I just read that like robots. I read that like like the Jonas AI um, from oh, before God. the Tour de France. Oh no! Oh no! Don't bring that back. <laughs> oh, so awful. But, and similarly, he he goes on to say, I think it's a shame that we are still suffering from what happened twenty to thirty years ago, which I think is, I mean, uh, that's a quote you hear an awful lot. You hear from Pogacar to Wiggins and everyone really since 2012 when Lance Armstrong did that interview with Oprah Winfrey and everything sort of unraveled from then onwards. So, I mean, it, it's a pretty run of the mill doping conversation, but Jonas then also, I mean, in the, in the piece as well, he does admit to being feeling guilty about missing that doping test. It's not something you want to have weighing on your conscience, which I think is, is, is incredibly fair. Um, we don't know if other riders have... I mean, other writers probably don't get the opportunity to talk about their doping past, really, in Danish newspapers. Um, or, I mean, not doping past, but, you know, talk, sp- speaking about doping in the sport in general, uh, the Danish newspapers, maybe sort of this has happened to Pogacar, maybe it happened to like, another writer. It's purely speculative. We don't know. But Vanko is taking the opportunity to sort of be frank and honest. Yeah, I think it's quite bold of him to actually be honest. Like you said, uh, I don't think many others would do this. Like you said as well, Patrick, he's putting himself in in the haters way which i'm certainly not one of but yeah the 2019 season and uh, i mean you spoke about his uh, tour polonia thing in the interview i did with him before anyone knew who he was in the english sphere he said that in that tour Pol- poland he really struggled with the burden of leadership and that's why he completely cracked on the final day as well all right yeah that's interesting. He's, yeah, he's quite an open guy. Maybe the Yumba Visma media team was so tied up with this whole like Lisa bike announcement that nobody was checking on Jonas. So he just went a little bit rogue. 
And now the me like the media team's like, oh my god, <laughs> what's he said? What's he said? Why 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 has he said something about doping? But now I like it. I like that he's open about it. I like that he revealed that I don't know, vulnerability, if you can call it that. I give him more respect for for talking about that quite openly. I think that is a better way of doing it than what, like, with Sky, with the TUEs, that was kind of kept under, and then it came out later. I thought that was a bit yeah. strange. If you just try and kick it under the rug, then it's, like, much worse. As is the case of all things, people. Here's a life lesson for you. Communication is key. Just, just talk about it, and then people won't be as mad, all right? Because they know what's going to hit them. So communication is key. Just talk about it. I don't think this is interesting because, like, in the 2022 Tour de France and in the press conference after the Rocamadour time trial, they were very defensive about questions about this kind of thing. And I like how it's kind of gone full circle, but that might also be because this is Jonas one on one with a Danish journalist instead of being in a probably church hall, primary school, maybe high school, somewhere in, in rural France, having to answer questions to lots of press people about the subject of doping. Well, yeah, last year they got quite defensive, almost to the point of being quite sort of deflective. This is 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 very very different from Jonas. I think this also just show goes to show his emotional sort of journey that he's been on as well, and, and in becoming more sort of chilled out and open. Particularly this year's Tour de France, you notice him being more at ease and more sort of confident and comfortable within himself than he was in 2022. And I think that's important for him psychologically as as the leader of his team as well going forward uh, at Visma Lisa Bike, as it will now officially be known as they released this week yeah i agree with that but i mean i don't yeah every every team every yellow jersey winner is defensive now because of that past with last armstrong it's not like i feel like all of them are very defensive on that first rest day second rest day them talking about i guess in the heat of what well, heat like you know the middle of a race when they're probably quite stressed about just the race situation as it is and focusing on doing the best job possible but being questioned about doping and the legitimacy of you dropping your, your your rivals by a minute you know that'll be quite annoying if you're just like i just did a really good performance really proud of myself and now people are questioning my my like legitimacy of the result you, you would be quite ups, like frustrated about that in comparison to talking about it in the off season there's not the stress of racing going on so maybe you're more level-headed and able to talk about things a bit more clearly but we might as well move on and i mean this isn't really related to your being goal even though it's uh, doping and it's about fish as he's been a fish worker in the past but i mean did you guys see this weird article that it's the new doping that has helps your hemoglobin levels or something like that yeah, I'll you... preface this by saying I'm probably the least qualified to talk about this. <laughs> I have an arts degree. These two actually don't understand science. But it's a lugworm, which can be used in fishing, like recreational, like fly fishing. And uh, there were reports there from French publications, such as Keep, saying that apparently this can really help your hemoglobin, which of course helps with how much blood you can take, which is amazing for endurance sports. I don't know if, if this is really good to be used <laughs> by professional athletes. Uh, there were quotes saying that like people will do anything to sort of cheat and cheat and cheat. But do you really think people are going to start eating lugworms to improve and to improve the hemoglobin? I don't know. I mean, but for people wondering about how it works, um, basically the lugworms, because they're like sandworms, because they live in like very water-saturated conditions, they need to be really good at getting oxygen from their environment. So their like hemoglobin just has a higher affinity for oxygen, basically, in comparison to us humans, because we live in a beautiful aired condition so when you live in water because there's less oxygen available you need to have like better hemoglobin that's basically how it works um are people going to start using us honestly i don't honestly I, I, they might do if doping is a thing nowadays i think it's probably a little bit more sophisticated to be honest with you there's probably technologies that we don't even know about which improve your physiological condition which the wada or whatever kind of anti-doping sort of national bodies that might be going around like ones that picked up Hessman for example they probably don't even know about these kind of things they don't even have tests they don't even have laboratory equipment they don't even know what biomarker to be looking for in people's blood they probably have a checklist that they're going through and if somebody goes outside of a range it, it gets blipped up but if they don't know what thing they're looking for if it is high they don't they're not going to suspect anything so I suspect that if there is doping going on, it's probably not something like 
having bloodworm hemoglobin because I think that would probably get pinged up pretty easily. So I think it's probably a bit something a bit more sophisticated. I don't think people are going around eating worms. This is like the most like French way to do. <laughs> yeah, like, it's yeah. it's so like. Uh, but but you have to eat the the worms. The, the worms give you more uh, hemoglobin. And after that, you you can write for, for 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 hours and hours like that. They're too scared. Like look, it's like actual like wind tunnel testing. But eat the worms. Yeah. Like <laughs> something. Yeah. Anyways, but just like go to go to Haba in Bordeaux, and you just find worms, and you just just eat, just eat them. Like there you go. For any new listeners or viewers, I'm just gonna point out that Ewan's actually fluent in French, so that was a perfect French English impression, I guess. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I am not. <laughs> we're learning, so we're trying to catch up. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe it is. How readily available are they? Oh, no, just you can go buy anything on the internet. Yeah, you could, you could, you could buy a lot. So basically, right. So here's here's my question, right? If I start eating lugworms, right, am I going to start winning the category one races in my area? Because if so, I'm right. So I'm right. I'll tell you what. I'll start eating them. And because British cycling is so whack, they won't test me. So I'll just go and see if I can win category. That is going to be a fantastic YouTube video. I ate lugworms to see if I can cheat my way to get winning category one races. Subscribe, people, because I'd say if we get if we get 10,000 likes, I'll do it. I'll eat a load of lugworms and I'll try and win a cat one race. Me yeah. versus St. Piran, head to head. I can <laughs> beat anyone on Trinity if I just have some lugworms. Honestly clip that we'll have to post like a content warning on like the worm eating part of the video <laughs> that's so that is that is so horrifying they can like they're moving and stuff it's it's like a challenge on, on the tv oh, shows so either or something oh, oh yeah be a factor <laughs> yeah i'll blend it up i reckon maybe that'll be that, that'll probably release the the, the the hemoglobin a bit easy a bit, a bit better i think i guess there's just like a protein shake cal st piran i'm coming for you look worms plus me and you're gonna ride for them in 2025, then. Yeah, legit, legit. They better watch out. I'm winning all the GP next year. But I mean, anyway, a weird doping, whatever we call it, aside, new doping. I don't know. Uh, Chris Froome has also been in the media to do with the poor form, and allegedly, uh, I think he said that was that down to the bike fit, which has now been denied by management and Israel Premier Tech. So. Obviously, Chris Froome, we know him as a four-time Tour de France champion, two-time Welter champion, one-time Giro champion. But yeah, I just feel every time a worse results come in his Palmares or things like this, it kind of etches a bit away from that legacy he built up. And also, I think this is kind of a bit of like a public spat, really, almost. It spiraled between him and Sylvan Adams that keeps playing out. Uh, Froome saying like, oh, yeah, my setup was different, blah, 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 blah. The crash had changed. And Sylvan Adams as well, using his platform to talk about the state of Israel at the moment, which I don't necessarily think is the right sort of platform for him to be using as a manager of a cycling team to be talking about, about, about these kind of things right now when his team is bearing the name of one of the states, one of the state belligerents. It, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a very strange phase for the Sylvan Adams and Chris Froome debate, to be honest. I really hope we can fast forward three months. If you're still in their books by next year, then, I mean, yeah, sure, you can go to the, the, the Tropicala Misa Bongo and sign a couple hats for some people, you know. It's very easy to forget that, uh, yeah, this criticism is coming from a world champion because, as we all know, Sylvan Adams did win his age bracket from 65 to 69 years old and is therefore a certified world champion. So he knows a thing or two about bike racing, obviously, so we can't just poo-poo what he says. I feel like I'm in an episode of Black, I don't know. Um, yeah, so um, is Broom suffering from his saddle being a centimetre lower? Maybe. Yeah. If I lo- <laughs> am I am I going to start losing races because I lower my saddle by one centimeter? Is my lugworm advantage going to be completely shattered by my saddle height being a slightly a bit too low? Probably not. Chris Hoops has got like a tombola, and this is just excuses kind of spinning around in there. He just kind of like picks one out on a kind of bi-monthly basis and pulls it out. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of with Scott. Every excuse that comes out that's kind of feebly trying to excuse his short falling form is just another kind of little chip off of his legacy it's almost like the san marinese football team complaining that they don't win games because one of their players is injured you know like you weren't gonna win anyway 
Like, quit, quit trying to like get yourself out of the situation. This is one of your more rogue analogies. I mean, the Beyonce at a high school competition was rogue, but like this is rogue. San Marie's football team. I mean, do they even have enough Actually, players? But yes, I know they scored against Denmark. Cool against Denmark. Yeah, I know, I know. The Danish football team should all retire. What are we talking about? Chris San Marie's football. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> Chris Froome, Israel, San Marino's football team. Yeah, I swear this happened with Michael Matthews a few years ago where he was like, my saddle height start wasn't right. That was exactly the time when Michael Matthews started not winning as much. So Chris Room is on a very dark and slippery slope to failure right now. He needs to sort this saddle out and get going. It's a bonger. Yeah. To be fair, that was when Michael Matthews was riding for DSM and the... <laughs> oh, riders, riders at DSM will complain about anything about DSM whilst they're there. That's very true. But yeah, what does but... his... Next, 2024 look like with Chris Froome because he's still on the books, I guess. Making, <laughs> making more pull quotes for, for cycling web news websites to talk about. Um, Legit. I mean, his reel was funny. The one where he made fun of Bentley or whatever. That was good. That's what Chris Froome needs to now specialize in. Suck off racing. He needs to be Israel's PR manager. He could become a TikToker. I, is, uh, yeah. I think he is. I think he is on TikTok. He's definitely on YouTube. We know that. Probably, yeah. He's, yeah. he's 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 a he's a screen agent. Yeah, yes. I don't think Quadlock is going to quite fund his retirement enough. I think he needs to like get another source of income going. I think he could definitely get some kind of like rogue like sports nutrition company to kind of sponsor yeah. him, and then just be a bit of an Instagram fault. Do you think he needs more money? The man has won four Tour de France's. I think he's fine. He seems pretty determined to keep going for some reason, Scott. I don't know what it is. Why does he need to kick the can already? Keep the can, okay, that one done. Cycling wise, cycling wise, cycling wise, yes. A glimpse of hope is that my is that Michael Woods recent like just signed a contract renewal until the age that he will be thirty nine. So Chris Froome still could have a couple more years in him if Michael Woods' contract is anything to go by. But Woods did win the Tour de France stage this year, and Chris Froome didn't even ride the Tour de France this year. So yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see where he goes. But I think you know what. Sometimes these big names, having them in your books, if you just like lower the pay grade of them, it's quite it is still a big t- it is still a big deal for the team because even if Chris Froome says something silly, it'll still be Chris Froome parentheses Israel Premier Tag. Yeah, I, I mean he's probably not on the six million anymore. He's probably been lowered a bit. Next grand, <laughs> and he lives in Monaco. So no, no, he lives in France. So it, it is taxable. I thought he didn't. He doesn't live in Monaco. I, th- I thought he lived in Nice in France. Well, I mean, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, Teddy Pogaccio's salary isn't getting taxed. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, it's been a fun episode. We might as well go with the transfer talks or transfer news. And I mean, you and jumped the gun a bit with Philipson, the younger Philipson, the Danish one. How are you explaining that quote as well? He would fit perfectly into opposite now if Macho Van Poel doesn't want to do all the events. Then Philipson just roll him out for each one. But then they have so many like wonder kids coming through and they, they keep picking up these little children. But according to Chiros Con Emilio over at Gazzetta, it's now that the race has been whittled down to two teams in Bora Hansgrohe and Lidl Trek for Albert Philipson, uh, who won the junior road race this year in the road mountain bike. And was it cyclocross as well? It was, it was, yeah, huge, huge start. Uh, he's making his world tour jump, we believe, in 2025. So Bora or Lidl, guys, which one do you think? Mass Pedersen has like a majority share in Lidl track, and therefore he will end up going there more than likely. Well, Bora have Bora. a big Yeah, but Bora have spent literally every bit of cash on Primoz Roglic, and now they're crying wolf because they don't have enough money to maybe keep Ita Brooks on. And it's like, okay, so you're going to bring in the next freaking wonder kid and you could have enough money for him like i don't know something that's not quite working there for me there unless unless bore extraction fans are selling like absolute hot, hot cakes and then or is it hands grow? no no hands grows the shower one yes i got that for the right way around <laughs> yeah i'll go the legal trick I, I, as long as you don't go to ineos because they are rubbish at developing talent i'm all right with them well it appears that ineos are out of the race but ineos remain in the race for Ian Erdebrooks, um, whose relationship with Bora Hansgrohe is looking a little bit thin at the moment. There was a quote from him uh, this week. Would I stay with the team after next year? I'm not going to answer that. 
Well, we're going to try and answer that. Um, it looks like Ineos Grenadiers and Lidl Trek are the two teams left in the running for him. Ineos have been sort of the, in pole position, but they've been in pole position for a lot of these rumors and not ended up with the rider. Lidl Trek have signed so many riders this season. Which one of these two do you think he will end up at? You and you didn't answer the other one. Where do you think Philipson's going? Bora, Lidl Trek? I think it'll be cooler at Bora because Lidl, I think, I, I'm really hopeful about Thibaut Nays. I just think having to give, give Thibaut his own sort of room to grow with Quinn Simmons, Valtzak, and so forth. I think for a hands grower, I think it'll be cool to see what Philipson could do there. Also, with the deal with Specialized, we've seen them. We've seen Bora allow a bit to Koretsky, for instance, to do mountain biking. We haven't really seen Bora with cyclocross in the past, I don't think. I'm sure they're willing to expand into that market. For Specialized, to have a sort of the opportunity to have a big cyclocross star will be big for them, so they can shift more cyclocross bikes in Europe, uh, you could say, as well. Do they have cyclocross bikes? Specialized? Well, this is their chance to do Yeah, that. I don't know. Because, yeah, obviously, Pinarello, I think oh. they grabbed it with Pitcock. The same thing could happen here with Hammer, real, like, yeah. flagship person. And Simi Canyon has that, and Sabella have that with Van der Poel and Van Aert and so forth. And Trek now have that. Well, they're trying to have that with Thibaut Nace. Maybe having Thibaut Nace and Philipson at the same time might not really work. They're only, what, three, what, four years difference in age. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's quite big. But still, you know. Yeah, out the books, out the books. Where is he going to go? Probably any else. They are yeah. absolutely desperate. Yeah, they're at 3 a.m. in the nightclub and they haven't got with anyone yet. And they desperately need somebody. So I reckon Ida Brooks will definitely be... You're calling Ida Brooks the last resort. That's a bit harsh. He's like one of the future stars. Yeah, he, he is a future star. Yeah, I, I, I am high on Ida Brooks. I think he's great. But considering that Ineos have somehow whiffed Remco... And Roglic. Yeah, that was quite a drop of the ball. They've sort of effed up, to be honest with you, if all those stories are to be believed. So I think Ida Brooks does make sense to go to Ineos. I think that he's a bit of a long-term project, and obviously, as we all know, Ineos are going through a rebuild, apparently, still, for however many years. Next five years, ten years, twenty years, I don't know. Um, until until any awesome money r runs out, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I think Ida Brooks will probably go there. To be honest with you, that's that, that's kind of that's my thinking about it. I'm gonna say any else. I think. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we all agree. I think it's just a more conventional. But then whenever we have these ones with like grand tour people, we always say Ineos. Yeah, true. Like we all said, Roglic, Ineos. Remco, Ineos. <laughs> Never. Yeah, I said Bora, but that was also because uh, I do have a bit of a soft spot for Bora. Uh, okay, fair enough. But what was the other option for Icebox to go to? A stay at Bora. Little track, oh, anyone oh, saw stay at Bora. Oh, uh, well. No, Itabrooks is the one who's at 3 a.m. in a nightclub. And then... <laughs> it's the other way around. I got it the wrong way. Itabrooks is at 3 a.m. in a nightclub, and the lights have just come on, and they've just realized that they're about to get with Anios. There you go. I hope people appreciate my uh, my reference there. We've not anywhere. Um, but other transfers this week, never thought I'd be saying this one. Peter Sagan is heading over to RRK Group Pierre Baguette in 2024, a uh, Slovak continental squad where he's going to be doing a couple of road races next year. He's looking to transition to have his final year in mountain biking. And also a transfer, which I was sort of bamboozled about earlier this week, Seb Berwick is moving oh, yeah, to NRL. And the last one, the Trinity one, young Alaphilippe as Patrick called him. Paul uh, Manier? Manier. To sort out quick step. Yeah, he's just a... Oh, yeah, I don't know. It's just an Alaphilippe regen. I guess he's French. He's a bunch of... Uh, and I guess they're just going to try and hope uh, Alaphilippe just comes around again. But Manier to actually break through, which is where Alaphilippe obviously did all those years ago. So, oh, California needs to come back, which will make Scott happy. There you go. Yes. And you're true. Yeah, true. I'll be fine. But this French rider, he's 19, has been signed on a three year contract with Sudal, which is one of their longer contracts. So that's quite surprising to see that he's done that. So the team must have some faith in his numbers and so forth. Ah, uh, numbers. People love numbers. But, anyways, we might as well come to Rider of the Week. We're all kind of dreading this part. And I'll go first this time because I always get the short straw. So I'm going to pick Pin Run Hard because he won the Dublin World Cup. Yes, finally. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to go with. With hang on, Gerson Tok is my rider of the week. He 
is from Guatemala, and he won the Vuelta Ciclismo Internacional a Guatemala, which I know isn't the biggest race, but it is November, and he actually finished as a lowest position in a stage. He finished 13th, which I think is quite impressive, to be honest with you, considering that he came 6th, 12th, 12th, 4th, 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 7th, 13th, 5th, and then he won overall in GC. Watch out, he's coming for the World Tour. I'm going for for Zoe Baxter, who finished third in the women's race in Dublin. I I believe she announced that her and Femme Cabale are going in another pro rider. It's good to have some queer representation in cycling after all this time. So um, my pick is for Zoe Baxter. More for personal reasons than anything else. And she's British, I guess. Yeah, but she's Welsh. I don't believe in the nation of Wales. (laughs) Edit that out. Edit that out. Edit that out. I could not make you answer for that one. Edit that out. (laughs) That is so making it in. (laughs) Gary Thomas is coming for you. <laughs> Lots of clips in this episode. <laughs> so anyways, that's it for our 44th episode here of the National Cycling Podcast. I hope you appreciate this peak of nothingness that we are in this world of cycling right now. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Check us out on Spotify as well. Please give us a five-star review, as many of you have already. And you can follow us all over on Twitter, and I'll make sure to leave them all in the description down below. But with that, thank you for watching and we will see you next week.